Boldwood presents The Sisters, written by John Nicholl and read by Derrin Edwards. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 Detective Inspector Laura Kesey spotted the victim almost as soon as she entered West Wales Hospital's acute admissions ward. The skinny 19-year-old girl was lying propped up on three plump pillows. Her short, bright red hair and multiple blue tattoos contrasting dramatically against the starched white cotton covers. Kesey made a slight, involuntary grimace on witnessing the young woman's battered appearance. Her two black eyes, a torn lip, the misaligned nose and a missing front tooth transformed her otherwise pretty face into something akin to a Halloween mask. Physical injuries that were testament to the severe beating she'd received only hours before. The detective struggled to suppress her anger as she approached the bed, her sense of injustice burning bright as she met the girl's haunted gaze. Kesey settled herself, swallowing hard, adopting a professional persona keen to convey both approachability and calm efficiency, a combination of which she hoped would help put the young woman at her ease, or at least as far as was possible in the circumstances. Kesey had met victims like this before, unfortunate females dominated and abused by violent, manipulative males. She'd met more than she cared to recall, and the last thing Kesey wanted was to let the young woman down. Every case mattered to the detective, and incidents such as this more than most. The young victim removed her in-ear headphones, grimacing with each movement of her battered body, as the detective stood at the end of her hospital bed, focused on her and only her, resisting the almost overwhelming impulse to look away. Kesey shifted her weight from one foot to the other, forcing a thin smile before opening her mouth. When she spoke, it was in nasal brummy tones that some Welsh locals found challenging to decipher. Hello, Sally. My name's D.I. Kesey, Laura Kesey. Please call me Laura. I'm here to help you. The young woman averted her eyes to the wall, spitting her words, spewing them from her mouth. Yeah, like that's going to make all the fucking difference. Why don't you piss off and leave me alone? You can't help me. Nobody can. Kesey held her ground. It wasn't exactly the welcome she'd hoped for, but it wasn't entirely unexpected, and she'd heard a lot worse. I wouldn't be here if that were true. Sally was visibly sweating now, tiny beads of moisture exuding through the pores of her discoloured skin as she tugged on her ginger hair. Oh, give me a break. Have I got stupid stamped on my forehead or something? Who the fuck do you think you are? Superwoman? I know your limitations. I've been down this road before. Kesey pulled up a chair, sitting to the left side of the bed, next to a large picture window with a view of the busy car park below. The detective maintained as calm a tone as possible, speaking slowly, clearly enunciating each word, monotone, bordering on the melancholy. How are you feeling? It looks like he really did a job on you this time. The young woman emitted a long, deep, audible breath, more a groan than a murmur. Yeah, and he'll do it again if he finds out I've been talking to the likes of you. Why don't you fuck off and ruin someone else's day? If you think you're helping, you're kidding yourself. You're just making things worse. Your sort always do. Kesey paused before replying, taking her time, choosing her words with care. Pearson's in custody, Sally. He's locked up in a cell, and with your help we can get him convicted and imprisoned. Don't you think he deserves that, after all he did to you? I know it isn't going to be easy, but it matters. We can't let him get away with it. You can be free of him. I'll be with you every step of the way. Sally closed her eyes tight, screwing up her face, shutting out the world. When they flickered open moments later, Kesey thought the girl may start weeping. There was an unmistakable sadness about her, an absence of hope she couldn't hide. She looked past Kesey as she spoke. 
I've been here before, on the exact same ward, just over a year ago at Christmas. Sally pointed a trembling finger, decorated with peeling black nail polish. I was stuck in that bed over there, the one nearest the door. It depressed the hell out of me. People trying to be cheery, decorations, cards, carols, all that bollocks. That's not something you forget in a hurry. I can't believe I'm back here. I was hoping never to see the place again. Kesey shook her head slowly from right to left, first one way and then the other. She'd enjoyed a comparatively happy life, so unlike this girl, this victim of random circumstance, who'd drawn the short straw time and again. The detective clenched her hands into tight fists as she pictured Pearson in her mind's eye, recalling his denial, his dismissive lack of remorse. Kesey had never wanted to convict a man more. It felt strangely personal, as if the girl's future was her responsibility and hers alone. Any form of words seemed wholly inadequate. But she knew she had to say something. Just sitting there in pensive silence achieved nothing at all. That must have been truly awful for you. Not the best way to spend the holiday season. Sally turned away, gritting her teeth, her jaw clenched, changing the contours of her face. A DC David Harris made all sorts of empty promises. It was grievous bodily harm with intent, the worst kind of assault. That's what the Pratt said. And he was going to keep me safe. Mike could be locked up for a very long time. It was going to be years, life even, if things went well in court. That's what your pig friend told me in that oh-so-insistent way of his. And I believed him too. I made a written statement. I said I'd give evidence however frightened I felt inside. And then the court gave Mike bail. They released the bastard, as if he hadn't done anything at all. What the fuck was that about? Safe? Safe? I was shitting myself. The system let me down. Your lot let me down. I was in more danger than ever before. Kesey dropped her chin to her chest, suddenly lost for words. As the young woman continued her story, her voice repeatedly breaking with raw emotion as she relived events as if in real time. I was staying at my sister's place in Glendora Street, at the top of town, a one-bedroom flat on the first floor above the off-license. Mike came after me. He kicked the door in, and then he gave me the worst beating of my life. And he smashed the place up too. Punishment, he called it. I deserved it, apparently. My sister somehow managed to lock herself in the bathroom to dial 999 before he got in there and got hold of her too. But the bastard was long gone before you lot finally turned up. I was pissing blood for a week. Kesey nodded, feeling a heady mix of sympathy, anger and frustration. I've read the paperwork. Pearson was re-arrested, remanded and given six months. It should have been a lot longer. I totally accept that. For the first time, Sally met Kesey's tired eyes and held her gaze, looking back at her with an intense, fevered stare. The young woman rushed her words, her voice rising in tone and pitch, her reddened eyes flickering like a faulty bulb. Oh, yeah. He was given six months, all right, but he was released after three, twelve fucking weeks for kicking the crap out of me. And he assaulted my sister, too. He smashed her right in the face hard. He broke her nose. Twelve fucking weeks for all that. And then they released the bastard for good behaviour. Good behaviour? He doesn't know the meaning. How do you think that went for me? It wasn't great, I'll tell you that much. It would have been better if my sister had never rung you lot at all. Kesey sighed. I'm so very sorry to hear that. It must have been truly awful for you. But it's going to be different this time. Mike found me again on the first day he was out. He followed me down a back street after dark and dragged me back to his place. He told me he'd kill me if I ever spoke to the police again. And I believed him too. I still believe him. He's one vicious bastard. I think he's capable of almost anything. The quicker you're out of here, the happier I'll be. Because someone will tell him they always do. He knows a lot of people in this town. 
They like him. He's got spies everywhere. Kesey bounced a knee. Her question seemed redundant, pointless in the circumstances. But she had to ask it. What other choice did she have? So, am I right in thinking you're not ready to make a statement? Not a fucking chance! Kesey swallowed again, wondering why her mouth felt so very parched. She knew the system was inadequate. She knew it sometimes let victims down, but it was all she had. She had to work with it, failings and all. OK, I get that. I understand where you're coming from, and I'm not going to try to pressure you into doing something you don't want to do. Sally's expression hardened. Is that it, then? Are you going to piss off and leave me alone? Kesey moved to the very edge of her seat, leaning forward. I'm not ready to give up on you, quite yet. What's that supposed to mean? You're in control. I won't try to force you into anything you don't want to do. You've had more than enough of that in your life. But that doesn't mean I can't help you. I can ask the Crown Prosecution Service to prosecute Pearson without the need for you to appear in court. There should be more than enough evidence for a GBH charge. I can't promise you it would be successful, but there's an excellent chance, even without your direct involvement. Pearson may even plead guilty when his lawyer sees the full weight of evidence. The photographs alone would be more than enough to persuade most jurors to reach a guilty verdict. Sally's face took on an ugly, twisted sneer as she shook her head. No, not a chance. Don't even think about it. The bastard would make me drop the charges, and I would too. I'd do it in a heartbeat. Look at the state of me. It's too dangerous. I can't take the risk. The detective took a deep breath, inhaling through her nose and then slowly exhaling from her mouth for a silent count of three. You're not grasping what I'm telling you. I understand everything you've said. Honestly, I do. I'm sure I'd feel much the same in your place. But putting pressure on you to drop the case wouldn't help Pearson at all. I can talk to the prosecuting lawyers later today. If they go for it, I can tell him he's being taken to court despite your wishes to the contrary. I'd make it crystal clear that it's totally beyond your control that you've got no say in his being prosecuted, none whatsoever. And I'd do all I could to get him remanded in custody. I think it's highly likely I'd succeed, given his history of violence. He could be safely banged up in the remand wing at Swansea Prison by tomorrow at the latest. How does that sound? Sally wiped away a tear, nodding. There was the hint of a smile on her face, but it disappeared as quickly as it appeared. Yeah, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. Harris was full of crap, one empty promise after another. Maybe you're the same. I'm sorry if he let you down. If? Fucking if? I don't think there's much doubt about it, is there? I'll do everything I can to change your situation for the better. That's a promise. You have my word. One woman to another. I don't want you coming here again. Kesey's disappointment was almost palpable. She'd really thought she was winning. Oh, come on, Sally. You could be lying there worrying unnecessarily if I don't keep you informed. I can keep in touch by phone if you'd prefer. What happened to me being in control? That didn't last very long. What was it? About two minutes? Kesey felt inclined to argue, but she decided against. The girl had a point. We can do this your way. Whatever's best for you. You want me to talk to you on the phone? Are you winding me up? You haven't got a fucking clue. If Mike gets out, he'll check the thing. He'll go through every call. He always does. Kesey silently admonished herself for her lack of insight. OK. So how about I provide you with a new pay-as-you-go, with a few pounds credit? Pearson needn't know about it. What do you think? I could have it delivered to you today, here on the ward. All you have to do is say the word. Sally paused before responding. There's a payphone in the day room. I could call you from there, although I can't see that happening. 
You lot are next to useless. What would be the point? Kesey blew the air from her mouth. Are you okay for cash? There isn't exactly much to spend on in here. I was thinking about the payphone. It's not a problem. I've got my benefit money. If I decide to ring, I can. Kesey rose to her feet, pushing her chair aside. She handed Sally a small card, with her name and the central switchboard number printed on one side in bold capitals, black on white. Call that number and ask for me. I had a quick word with your consultant. It'll likely be days rather than weeks before you're out of here. Have you got anywhere to go? Sally stared into the distance, shoulders hunched over her chest. She looked suddenly smaller, almost childlike, as if the situation had carried her back in time. No, there's nowhere. What about your sister's place? You've stayed there before. Why not again? She's got a new bloke in her life. A right miserable git who can't stand the sight of me. He threw me out the last time I slept on the sofa. He rushed me right out into the street. I didn't even have time to get dressed. I was out there in my knickers and a t-shirt until he threw my things out after me. The bastard's off his fucking head. Kesey pressed her lips together. Is there nowhere else? Your parents' place, maybe? Sally laughed, a harsh laugh that had nothing to do with humour. I grew up in care from the age of six. Foster homes and then kids' homes, when I got a little older. One move after another. My birth parents weren't the nicest people in the world. Mum was on the game, Dad was a pimp. He'd sell her to anyone who'd pay. All that mattered was the heroine. And he never knew what to do with his hands. He didn't know whether to punch me or stroke me. Neither was great. I don't know which I hated the most. I think it was probably the stroking. I still feel his filthy hands on me sometimes when I'm alone in the dark. It can't have been easy. I'm sorry you had such a hard time. Oh, he was always sorry. Until he did it again. And Mum didn't give a shit. I haven't seen either of them for years. Hopefully it'll stay that way. They had fuck all interest in me, and I feel the same about them. Good fucking riddance. I thought I'd won the lottery when I first met Mike. A mature bloke, the odd spliff, a place of his own. But that all went sour pretty quickly. He didn't show his true colours until I moved in. Kesey searched for a satisfactory response. Something positive, something hopeful. Anything to alleviate the young woman's angst, even for a minute. Sometimes the suffering of others was almost too much to bear. Kesey used a line she'd used before, something she felt she could rely on. We can't rewrite the past, but we can change the future. How about I talk to the hospital social worker? Sally looked back with a sneer. Is that really the best you've got? Come on, Sally. It's not something you should dismiss out of hand. I've found her very helpful in other similar cases. There's always a high demand for accommodation in this part of the world. I can't guarantee she'll come up with something suitable, but she may do. Her name's Karen Hoyle. I can talk to her today, if you're in agreement. Hopefully she can help. I know she'd try her best. She always does. Sally turned to her side, picking up her smartphone, scrolling through the various music tracks on offer. Yeah, go on then. I suppose so. I had one half-decent social worker back in the day. A young bloke with a beard and glasses. Although most of the others were shit. I may as well give this Karen a try. It's not like I've got a lot of choices. What have I got to lose? Kesey nodded twice. Relieved, Sally had finally relented. It was a small victory, but a victory nonetheless. One small triumph in a sometimes insurmountable world of woe. OK, that's good to hear. I'll talk to Karen before heading back to the station. I'll put her fully in the picture and stress the urgency. Sally placed her headphones back in her ears, humming quietly as she closed her eyes tight shut. Kesey looked back at her for one final time before finally leaving the ward, one thought after another tumbling in her mind. The unfortunate young woman had seen and experienced 
so very much in her short lifetime. No wonder the girl was cautious. No wonder she was scared to trust. She appeared to be drifting away, living in the moment. It sometimes suited victims to forget for a time. It seemed Sally was one of those people. And who could blame her for that? Chapter Two The middle-aged, pencil-thin, helping professional stood close to the edge of Sally's hospital bed, smiling warmly, her horsey face framed by long, curly auburn hair, which tumbled over her shoulders in a tangled web that looked as if it hadn't been brushed in years. She was holding a well-thumbed A4 notepad in one hand and a yellow plastic biro in the other. She tapped the nib of the pen against the pad three times before speaking in a sing-song Welsh voice, rising and falling in rhythm. Hello, Sally. My name's Karen Hoyle. I'm the social worker here at the hospital. Inspector Kesey asked me to call in on you. She's put me fully in the picture, as promised. Are you happy to talk to me? I want to help you if I can. Sally adjusted her position, first one way and then another groaning quietly under her breath, unable to get comfortable. Her bruised ribs ached as the pain-killing drugs gradually lost their power. She was hoping for the best, but still fearing the worst. It didn't serve to get your hopes up, not in her world. The disappointment could be crushing. Sally glanced out of the window as the rain began to fall, large droplets running down the pane. I'm being kicked out of here sometime tomorrow morning, some doctor said they need the bed. Like I don't. I'll be on the streets again. It's a fucking nightmare in the summer, let alone when it's pissing down and bastard freezing. Where the fuck do I go? When Sally emitted a long, deep, audible breath, the social worker thought it was one of the saddest sounds she'd ever heard. Hoyle pulled the pale blue privacy curtain around the bed, thinking it next to useless, but better than nothing at all. Hoyle smiled again as she sat herself down, but her tone betrayed her concern. You're not going to be on the streets, Sally. You've been through more than enough already without that abomination. I'm not going to let that happen. Sally raised herself in the bed, suddenly more animated, using her hands to support her slight nine-stone frame. What do you mean? What are you saying? Can you talk to my consultant? Can I stay here a little longer? It's not great, but it's better than the streets. That's not an option, but there is a women's domestic violence refuge here in town. It's in Curzon Street, on the hill close to the park. Do you know it? Um, yeah, I think so. I know the street, maybe not the building. It's a large converted Victorian terraced house, intended for survivors in your circumstances, women and children in need of support and protection. I gave the manager a ring about half an hour ago, a wonderful caring lady named Ivy Breen. She was in the same situation in which you find yourself not so very long ago. Her abuser was killed in an accident about five years since. The brakes failed on his car just before he hit a wall at 60 miles an hour. Ivy's helped a lot of women since then, young women just like you. Hoyle paused, a beaming smile on her angular face. I would never celebrate any human being's death, but I do sometimes think of the accident as karma. Such things give us hope for the future. Wouldn't you agree? Maybe there is a God after all. Sally's eyes widened, the whites flashing. She had no real understanding of what Hoyle had talked of, but she'd taken an instant liking to this unusual woman with her positive vibes. But life had taught Sally pessimism. False hope was no hope. She was very much wishing for the best, but still fearing the worst. Can Ivy help me? What, what did she say? Hoyle beamed, the smile lighting up her face. You'll no doubt be glad to hear that a vacancy has just become available, it's a real stroke of luck. I can't stress that sufficiently. The timing really couldn't be better. It wouldn't be a long-term answer, of course. That's not how these things work. But it would at least give you a safe and secure place to stay for a time until you can find a suitable long-term alternative. What do you think? 
I can make necessary arrangements if you're in agreement. Ivy knows I'm discussing the offer with you. She's awaiting my call. Sally's relief was evident. Her shoulders slumping as her tears began to flow. She raised her open hands to her face, speaking through her fingers. Would I have my own room? Hoyle nodded enthusiastically. Yes, absolutely you would. There are six women in residence at any one time, some with children. I don't know how many little ones there are exactly. It changes from week to week. You'd have your own bedroom with a shared bathroom, lounge and kitchen. And there are excellent security features too. As you'd expect, given the building's purpose, the refuge can only be accessed via a high steel security gate with a four-number access code, which is changed regularly. And there's a panic alarm located on the wall in the hallway, linked directly to the local police station. It's a big red button. You can't miss it. If it's pressed, the police respond immediately. They're there in a matter of minutes. It's a simple, tried and tested system that works well. Ivy has developed an excellent working relationship with the other local services. That benefits the residents as well as her. Sally lowered her hands to her chest. That all sounds almost too good to be true. When can I go? So you want to accept the place? Yeah, too fucking right I do. Where the hell else would I go? This is the best news I've had in ages. Hoyle made some hurried, scribbled notes before standing. Right, I'll ring Ivy now and give her the good news. She'll be delighted. And I'll speak to your consultant to find out exactly what time you can leave in the morning. I'll run you to the refuge myself and make the necessary introductions. Change is never easy, even in the best of circumstances. A meet and greet should make it a little easier for you to settle in. Sally smiled for the first time that day. A thin, gap-toothed smile, but a smile nonetheless. She looked as happy as a much-loved child on a birthday morning. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so very much. This was the last thing I was expecting when I woke up this morning. I can't believe my luck. It's been fucking brilliant. It's like winning the lottery. I really appreciate everything you're doing for me. Really, I do. You're very welcome. And please don't hesitate to ring if there's anything else you need. Just contact the hospital switchboard and ask for me. They'll know where to find me. I'm never far away. OK, Ta, I will. You'll be allocated a community social worker in due course, someone from the adult services team here in town, but I'll keep in touch until that happens. It's a part of my role. I'll be there to support you. You won't be on your own. Thanks again. That's good to know. It's great to have someone on my side for a change. It doesn't happen often. The social worker stopped and turned on approaching the corridor, spinning smoothly on the ball of one foot. There is one thing I should probably mention before I head off. There's a no-swearing policy at the refuge. It's something Ivy's very strict on, for the benefit of the children. I hope that's not going to be a problem. Sally cursed crudely under her breath. That's not going to be an issue. I'm used to rules. I've been following them all my life. Chapter 3 The wind was unrelenting. It drove before it sheets of icy rain that swept in off the Irish Sea, painting the Welsh countryside in an eerie grey-white hue that made Beth shiver, despite her car's relative warmth. She sat huddled in the driver's seat, with the engine slowly idling, the vehicle carefully hidden from a quiet country road, on a stone-strewn sidetrack with high hedges to either side, leading to a dairy farm on the hill beyond. Beth checked her watch for the fourth time in under five minutes, asking herself if any man would go running on such a dank winter night, however dedicated, however obsessive, however prone to excess. But then... There he was in front of her, only a few seconds late, a slave to habit, jogging up the steep incline of the hill with surprising ease, his head bowed, focusing on the road at his feet as the sleet continued to fall. The man left her sight within seconds, seemingly oblivious to her existence as she increased the speed of the small car's wipers. 
preparing to follow him, despite the almost irresistible inclination to switch off the engine as if she hadn't seen him at all. But what would that achieve? She'd made a commitment. She was there for a reason. All the waiting, all the planning, the anticipation and the soul-searching had led to this precise moment in time. She'd pictured these very events in her mind's eye time and again. She'd imagined them. She'd rehearsed them. And now the time was here. There would be no going back. Not now. It was far too late for that. How could she live with herself if she lost her nerve, letting everyone down at the worst possible time? Beth breathed deeply, sucking in the air and counting slowly to five as she gripped the steering wheel still tighter with clenched hands that wouldn't stop shaking. She thought she could feel her heart pounding in her throat as she manoeuvred out into the quiet road, her headlights reflecting off the back of the man's yellow water-resistant windcheater jacket as he continued his run, one determined step after another. Beth swallowed hard, once, then again. Her eyes narrowed to slits as she pressed her foot down on the accelerator, speeding towards him as he looked back, growing concern contorting his otherwise ordinary features. As if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. As if he knew what she was there to do. Beth could see the growing fear in the man's eyes as she held her foot down, resisting the desire to hit the brake or swerve away. She gritted her teeth, jaw tightly clenched as she urged herself on. Come on, come on. He deserves it. The bastard deserves to die. She continued to accelerate. Thirty, thirty-five, forty miles an hour, brief seconds seeming like minutes as the man attempted to scramble up the high icy hedge to his right. But the incline was too steep, the earth too slippery, the absence of suitable footholds insurmountable, however hard he tried to escape the vehicle rushing towards him. The man slithered back despite his every panic-stricken effort. And then, there he was in front of her, at her mercy. A rabbit caught in the headlights, frozen, statue-like, getting nearer and nearer. The car hit the man, bang full on and at speed. A loud thud sending him bouncing over the bonnet, crashing into the windscreen and then tumbling onto the quiet road with dark blood pouring from a head wound as he lay twitching, one leg twisted at a seemingly impossible angle. Beth hit the brake hard now, fighting to keep control of the car as it skidded to an eventual stop. She switched off the engine, opened the driver's door, listening intently, scanning the road with quick darting eyes, confirming the absence of any approaching vehicles, before leaving her car and walking slowly towards the man, who was moaning incoherently. More sounds than words. She stood looking down at him, nudging him with a foot once, then again, thinking him close to death, no longer a threat to her or anyone else. But then he opened one eye, and then the other, looking up at her in the semi-darkness, his torn lips moved as if attempting to speak. But no words came, just garbled sounds that made no sense at all. Beth peered down at him for a few seconds more, feeling a confusing mix of sympathy and revulsion as she turned and walked away. Beth was shivering uncontrollably as she slumped back into the driver's seat on autopilot, her clothes soaked down to her cotton underwear. She checked her rear-view mirror, pushed in the clutch, and then engaged the reverse gear, succeeding on the second attempt, telling herself she had no option but to finish what she'd started. She pressed down on the accelerator, not allowing herself time to change her mind, closing her eyes tight shut for just a fraction of a second as the car's passenger side rear wheel hit the man's head full on, fracturing his skull and tearing the flesh from his face as it grated against the surface of the rough tarmac. Beth was sweating profusely despite the winter cold as she reversed on a few yards past his body, turning the headlights to the main beam with the flick of a lever and staring at his broken corpse, satisfying herself that he was dead this time, before speeding past him back in the direction of town. Beth drove on for about five minutes, tears running down her face in a steady stream that she feared may never stop until she was old, wrung out and dry. 
She turned to her left, bringing the car to a sudden skidding halt in the grounds of an ancient dilapidated stone cottage, out of sight of the road. The sleet had eased slightly by the time she exited the vehicle. She told herself it was a good sign, a sign she'd done the right thing, that the universe was on her side, that she should continue with her plan, despite her misgivings. She removed the car's fuel cap, took a red plastic petrol can from the boot, and then emptied half its contents over the seats and dashboard. She poured the remainder of the accelerant over the car's body, struck a match, sheltering the flame with her hands for what felt like an age, before finally tossing the match through an open door. Beth staggered backwards, shaken by the sudden intensity of the blistering heat as blue-yellow flames exploded into life, leaping high into the dark sky, lighting the entire area with dancing shadows that seemed to come alive. She flung the petrol container into the blaze, then turned away. Hurriedly climbing a five-bar farm gate, and dropping into the adjoining field, stumbling and almost falling before finally regaining her balance. She looked back at the inferno just once before rushing away, pacing quickly over the gradually freezing ground in the direction of town. As she trudged on, eyes focused forward, not looking back, the car's petrol tank suddenly exploded with the ferocity Beth feared couldn't fail to gain attention, however remote the area. She looked around her for non-existent prying eyes, first one way and then another, before breaking firstly into a jog and then a fevered run, panting hard, increasing her pace with each loping step towards a cluster of mature trees which offered shelter. Come on, keep going, keep going, you can do it, girl, one step at a time. Beth reached up, wiping the tears from her eyes with the back of a blue-white mottled hand as she reached the first of the trees a tall oak, bare of leaves. She paused, sucking in the cold night air, allowing the large trunk to support her weight as she rested, still panting, her chest rising and falling in a rapid rhythmic motion. She spat out a mouthful of acidic vomit as her gut twisted, her mind racing. She'd done the right thing, hadn't she? Of course I did, of course I did. She repeated it time and again as she began jogging again, already exhausted, her legs stiffening and complaining with each adrenaline fueled step. It was time to stop thinking, time to still her troubled mind. She was going to need all her available energy for what came next. It was going to be a long trek home. Chapter 4 it took Beth a little under two hours, trudging through sodden fields, scrambling over icy hedgerows, slipping, falling, grazing both knees, before she reached the women's domestic abuse refuge in a quiet side street on the outskirts of Carmarthen, close to the park. She'd avoided the main streets on reaching the small West Wales market town, collar up, head down, keen to avoid both potential witnesses and the limited number of CCTV cameras recording images in certain public places, the town square and surrounding area. Being caught on camera was the last thing Beth wanted, however bad the weather, however dark the night, however unlikely she'd be recognised in the grainy black and white images. Any record of her secret activities was unthinkable. That went without saying. The consequences could be dire both for her and for others. Everything had to be kept on a strictly need-to-know basis, Secrecy was everything. Getting caught wasn't a part of the plan. As she approached the secure high steel gate leading to the refugee's reinforced front door, an overwhelming sense of relief swept over her like an irresistible tide, washing away her worries, aches and pains as if by magic. It was a high of sorts, a release of natural feel-good chemicals, infinitely better than that engendered by any illicit drug, and in that instant... She knew that her night's work was accomplished. She'd done the right thing, a good thing, a worthy thing. That's what mattered. She'd triumphed and lived up to her commitments, just as promised. The abusive bastard was dead, gone, but never forgotten. And the world was better for it. She repeated it in her head. I've done the right thing. I've done the right thing almost believing it. 
but there were still doubts, nagging uncertainties that wouldn't let up. Thou shalt not kill, the Ten Commandments. Memories of childhood Sunday school lessons. Doubts that ate away at her peace of mind like a hungry dog gnawing on flesh. Beth reached up to enter the four-number security code which opened the gate, allowing both residents and the refugees' exclusively female staff to pass. She tried once, then again, but without success. It wasn't that she couldn't recall the number. That was ingrained on her psyche, as if carved in tablets of stone. No, her dirty, blue-white frozen fingers were the problem. They wouldn't stop quivering as the mid-January cold continued to bite. Her entire body was trembling in her drenched, woefully inadequate clothing.